Hello, and welcome to The Essential Reads. My name is Isaac, and my goal is to bring to you a bunch of classic audiobooks in an easy and accessible way. Uh, for the next two chapters of Huckleberry Finn, you will notice, as in the last chapter, there is no video format. If you're listening on podcast, you have nothing to worry about. If you're listening on YouTube, you have nothing to worry about, except you won't be able to see my face, which, frankly, is fine. Because it already creeps me out that I have to do it, but YouTube and... Um, yeah. All that fun stuff. So, there's no my face for the next three chapters, and that is how it will be. Let's dive in. Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 33 So I started for town, in the wagon, and when I was halfway, I see a wagon coming. And sure enough, it was Tom Sawyer, and I stopped and waited till he come along. I says, hold on, and it stopped alongside, and his mouth opened like a trunk, and stayed so, and he swallowed two or three times like a person that's got a dry throat, and then says, I ain't never done you no harm, you know that, so then what do you want to come back and hate me for? I says, I ain't come back, I ain't been gone. When he heard my voice, it rightened him up some, but he weren't quite satisfied yet. He says, Don't you play nothing on me, because I wouldn't on you. Honest Injun now. You ain't a ghost? Honest Injun, I ain't, I says. Well, I... Uh, well, that ought to settle it. But of course, I can't somehow seem to understand it, no way. Looky here, weren't you ever murdered at all? Nope. I weren't ever murdered at all. I played on him. You come in here and feel me if you don't believe me. So he done it, and it satisfied him. And he was glad to see me again. He didn't know what to do, and he wanted to know all about it right off, because it was a grand adventure and mysterious. And so it hit him where he lived. But I said, leave it alone till by and by, and told his driver to wait, and we drove off a little piece. And I told him the kind of fix I was in and what he'd reckon we better do. He said, let him alone a minute, and don't disturb him. So he thought and thought, and pretty soon he says, It's all right, I got it. Take my trunk in your wagon, and let on, it's yourn. And you turn back and fool along slow, so as to get to the house about the time you ought to, and I'll go toward town piece, and take a fresh start, and get there a quarter or half an hour after you, and you needn't let on you know me at first. I says, all right, but wait a minute. There's one more thing, a thing that nobody don't know but me. And that is, there's a n here that I'm trying to steal out of slavery. And his name's Jim. Old Miss Watson's Jim. He says, what? Why, Jimmy? He stopped himself and went to studying. I says, I know what you'll say. You'll say it's dirty, low-down business. But what if it is? I'm low-down, and I'm a-going to steal him. And I want you to keep mum and not let on. Will you? His eyes lit up, and he says, I'll help you steal him. Well, I let go all halts then, like I was shot. It was the most astonishing speech I ever heard. And I'm bound to say, Tom Sawyer felt considerable in my estimation. Only, I couldn't believe it. Tom Sawyer, a nigger stealer? Oh, shucks, I says. You're joking. I ain't joking, either. Well, then, I says, joking or not joking, if you hear anything said about a runaway n don't forget to remember that you don't know nothing about him. And I don't know nothing about him. Then we took the trunk and put it in my wagon, and he drove off his way, and I drove mine. But of course, I forgot all about driving slow on account of being glad and full of thinking, so I got home a heap too quick for that length of a trip. The old gentleman was at the door, and he says, Why, this is wonderful. Who ever would have thought that it was in that man to do it? I wish we'd attend her, and she hain't sweated a hair, not a hair. It's wonderful. Why, I wouldn't take a hundred dollar for that horse now. I wouldn't, honest. And yet I'd a sort of a fifteen before, and thought twas all she was worth. 
That's all he said. He was the innocentest, best old soul I ever see. But it weren't surprising, because he weren't only just a farmer. He was a preacher, too, and had a little one-horse log church down back of the plantation, which he built himself at his own expense, for church and a schoolhouse, and never charged nothing for his preaching. And it was worth it, too. There was plenty other farmer preachers like that, and done it the same way down south. In about half an hour, Tom's wagon drove up to the front stile, and Aunt Sally, she see it through the window, because it was only about 50 yards, and says, Why, there's somebody come. I wonder who tis. Why, I do believe it's a stranger, Jimmy. That's one of the children. Run tell Lizzie to pour another plate for dinner. Everybody made a rush for the front door, because, of course, a stranger don't come every year. And so he lays over the yellow fever for interest when he does come. Tom was over to style and staring for the house. The wagon was spinning up the road for the village, and we was all bunched in the front door. Tom had his store clothes on, and an audience, and that was always nuts for Tom Sawyer. In them circumstances, it weren't no trouble to him to throw in an amount of style that was suitable. He weren't a boy to meet you along up that yard like a sheep. No, he come calm and important like the ram. When he got in front of us, he lifts his hat ever so gracious and dainty, like it was the lid of a box that had butterflies asleep in it, and he didn't want to disturb him, and says, Mr. Archibald Nicholas, I presume. No, my boy, says the old gentleman. I'm sorry to say your driver has deceived you. Nicholas place down a matter of three miles or more. Come in, come in, come in. Tom, he took a look back over his shoulder and says, Too late, he's out of sight. Yes, he's gone, my son. You must come in and eat your dinner with us, and then we'll hitch up and take you down to Nicholas's. Oh, I can't make you so much trouble. I couldn't think of it. I'll walk. I don't mind the distance. But we won't let you walk. It wouldn't be sudden hospitality to do it. Come right in. Oh, do, says Aunt Sally. It ain't a bit of trouble to us. Not a bit in the world. You must stay. It's a long, dusty three mile, and we can't let you walk. And besides, I've already told him to put on another plate when I see you coming, so you mustn't disappoint us. Come right in and make yourself at home. So Tom, he thanked them, very hearty and handsome, and let himself be persuaded and come in. And when he was in, he said he was a stranger from Hicksville, Ohio, and his name was William Thompson. And he made another bow. Well, he run on and on and on, making up stuff about Hicksville and everybody in it he could invent. And I, getting a little nervous, wondering how it was going to help me out of my scrape. And at last, still talking along, he reached over and kissed Aunt Sally right on the mouth, and then settled back again in his chair, comfortable, and was going on talking. But she jumped up and wiped it off the back of her hand and says, You audacious puppy! He looked kind of hurt and says, I'm surprised at you, ma'am. You're shrimp. I've got a good notion to take and... Say, what do you mean by kissing me? He looked kind of humble and says, I didn't mean nothing by it, ma'am. I didn't mean no harm. I, I thought you'd like it. Why, you're a born fool. She took up the spinning stick and it looked like it was all she could do to keep from giving him a crack with it. What made you think I'd like it? Well, I don't know. Only they... They told me you would. They told you I would. Whoever told you is another lunatic. I never heard the beat of it. Who's they? Why, everybody. They all said so, ma'am. It was all she could do to hold in. And her eyes snapped. And her fingers worked like she wanted to scratch him. And she says, Who's everybody? Out with their names. Or they'll be an idiot short. He got up and looked distressed and fumbled his hat and says, I'm sorry, I weren't expecting it. They all told me to. They all said, kiss her and she'll like it. They all said it, every one of them. But I'm sorry, man. I won't do it no more. I won't. Honest. You won't, won't you? Well, I should reckon you won't. No, I'm honest about it. I won't ever do it again till you ask me. Till I ask you, I'll lay you'll be the Methuselah nun skull of creation before I ask you, or the likes of you. Well, he says, it 
does surprise me so. I can't make it out somehow. They said you would, and I thought you would. But he stopped and looked around, slow, like he wished he could run across a friendly eye somewheres, and fetched up on the old gentleman's and says, Didn't you think she'd like me to kiss her, sir? I, I, well, well, no, I believe I didn't. And then he looks all around the same way to me and says, Tom, didn't you think Aunt Sally'd open up her arms and say, Sid, sir? My land, she says, breaking in and jumping for him. You imprudent young rascal to fool a body so. And was going to hug him, but he fend her off and says, Nope, not till you ask me first. She didn't lose no time but asked him and hugged him and kissed him all over and over again. And then she turned him over to the old man and he took what was left. And after they got a little quiet again, she says, Why, dear, why, dear me, I never see such a surprise. We weren't looking for you at all, but only Tom. Sis never wrote to me about anybody coming but him. It's because it weren't intended for any of us to come but Tom, he says. But I begged and begged, and at the last minute, she let me come, too. So, coming down the river, me and Tom thought it would be first-rate surprise for him to come here to the house first, and for me to by and by tag along and drop in and let on to be a stranger. But it was a mistake, Aunt Sally. This ain't no happy place for a stranger to come. No, not imprudent whip, Sid. You ought to had your jaws boxed. I ain't been so put out since I don't know when. But I don't care. I don't mind the terms. I'd be willing to stand a thousand such jokes to have you here. Well, to think of that performance. I don't deny I was most putrefied with astonishment when you give me that smack. We had dinner out in the broad, open passage betwixt the house and the kitchen, and there was things enough on that table for seven families, and all hot, too. None of your flabby, tough meat that's laid in the cupboard in a damp cellar all night and tastes like a hunk of old cannibal in the morning. Uncle Silas, he asked a pretty long blessing over it, but it was worth it, and it didn't cool it a bit, neither, the way I've seen them kind of interruptions do lots of times. And there was a considerable good deal of talk all afternoon, and me and Tom was on the lookout all the time, but weren't no use. They didn't happen to say nothing about any runaway, and we was afraid to try and work up to it. But at supper, at night, one of the little boys says, Pa, mayn't Tom and Sid and me go to the show? No, says the old man. I reckon there ain't gonna be any, and you couldn't go if there was, because the runaway n***a told Burton and me all about the scandalous show, and Burton said he would tell the people so I reckon they drove the audacious loafers out of town before this time. So there it was, but I couldn't help it. Tom and me was to sleep in the same room and bed. So, being tired, we bid good night and went up to bed, right after supper, and clumb out of the window and down the lightning rod and shoved for town, for I didn't believe anybody was going to give the king and duke a hint, and so, if I didn't hurry up and give him one, they'd get into trouble sure. On the road, Tom, he told me all about how it was reckoned I was murdered, and how Pap disappeared pretty soon and didn't come back no more, and what a stir there was when Jim run away, and I told Tom all about our royal nonsuch rapscallions, and as much as the raft voyage as I had time to, and as we struck into town and up through the middle of it, it was as much as half after eight then, here comes a raging rush of people, with torches, and an awful whooping and yelling and banging tin pans and blowing horns, and we jumped to one side to let them go by. And as they went by, I see they had the king and the duke astraddle of a rail. That is, I knowed it was the king and duke, though they was all over tar and feather, and didn't look nothing in the world that was human. Just looked like a couple of monstrous big soldier plumes. Well, it made me sick to see it, and I was sorry for them poor pitiful rascals. It seemed like I couldn't ever feel any hardness against them any more in the world. It was a dreadful thing to see. Human beings can be awful crow to one another. We see we was too late. Couldn't do no good. We asked some stragglers about it, and they said everybody went to the show looking very innocent and laid low and kept dark till the poor king was in the middle of his cavortins on the stage. Then somebody gave a signal, and the house rose up and went for him. So we poked along back home, and I weren't feeling so brash as I was before, but kind of ornery and humble and to blame somehow, though I hadn't done nothing. But that was always the way. 
It don't make no difference whether you do right or wrong. A person's conscience ain't got no sense and just goes for him anyway. If I had a yellow dog that didn't know no more than a person's conscience did, I would poison him. It takes up more room than all the rest of a person's insides, and yet ain't no good, no how. Tom Sawyer, he says the same. Thank you so very much for listening. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, share, all that jazz. And if you really enjoyed, do subscribe, because there is more to come. And if you want to support me, Patreon exists, and it's wonderful and allows me to continue doing this, um, which would be great. And you also get some cool things, like exclusive audiobooks that you can only get on Patreon. Um, it feels so good to know that the Duke and the King have had their comeuppance. It would maybe be preferable that they weren't tarred and feathered, because if you know anything about that, I have no idea how that continued on well into like the 1960s and 70s. That was an awful practice, and the fact that humans are capable of such things reminds me every day that we suck. We really suck. But, um, I'm not going to say what it is, but look at it in your own time. Um, it's awful. But <laughs> that's not what this show is about. So let's end here. Once again, thank you very much for listening. And until next time, bye-bye.